And the only way we can do that is one way, by having all the people of all the different nationalities and ethnic groups to all work together. Because this world is composed of human beings. And as a man who I highly respect a great deal, and the man I respect a whole lot is, is a man named the uh, Noble Drew Ali. Noble Drew Ali said that love is the most important thing in the world because hate destroys. I remember when I was in this particular war, they had an organization known as Crow. And I made sure that the leaders of the Lithuanian community understood that this was not an organization that was practicing or teaching hate, but it was an organization that was trying to uplift the community and not tear it down. I'm sure you all know of uh, Munir Muhammad. I don't see him very often now. You know, sometimes I get to thinking about what Dr. King said. Dr. King said the uh, one experience that I had, which I will never forget, is not those people who falsely accused me, but I thought about all of those individuals who knew the truth. And as Dr. King said, the appalling silence of the good people who said nothing when they knew the truth. One of the things that I would look at now is that we have stimulus money, for example. If I was there in the city council, it would be a complete issue because we need stimulus money in order to help to revive communities on the west side, communities in Inglewood. There's many things that could be done. We could have housing redone, abandoned bu buildings fixed up. We could have corporations that will do one particular thing. The corporations could come about and make sure that they trained individuals in order to do home repair. Because we have many in, uh, many organizations that could do that. You know, I'm thinking of uh, an organization called uh, Gordy Foundation, where they take ex-offenders and they have them in a barbering program. They train them how to rehabilitate property, do drywalling. They do many other things that have to do with roofing, that has to do with rehabilitating a house. Because you can't just bring somebody back, for example, from prison with no school. No schooling, because there was a legislature that says you can't do that. We're gonna take that away. If they're in prison, they can't go to college. So what do you do? You send them back to the community and when you send them back to the community, they come back to the community with nothing. Nothing to do, nothing to say. The only thing they can do is probably go back into their old habits. Now, I always told people, as a young man, I'll never forget him, who was in prison with me. A young man, he was from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And he told me, he said, you know, old man, because they had told us to go and do some mopping. He said, I don't do no mopping. I didn't come here to do no mopping. I came here to do some time. And I talked to him and said, look, young fellow, you'll do more time if you go into the hole because you'll lose your good time. So let's go on and take care of this here so that you keep your good time and you're able to get some more. And he said to me, you know some old man? If they weren't making money off of us, we wouldn't even be in here. He said, look at that truck over there, bringing all that food in here. Somebody making a lot of money. Look at that truck over there, bringing milk in here. Somebody making a lot of money. He said, you know what? Look at that truck over there, bringing meat in here. Somebody's making a lot of money. So I always came to a, a complete conclusion after that, that crime does pay. Crime pays everyone except those individuals who go to prison. It pays the judges, it pays the lawyers, it pays the clerks, it pays 
the uh, individuals that supply the food, individuals that supply the shoes. They even have in the federal system uh, what they call the Un Unicor, which is a prison industry program. But there's something very strange about the prison industry program. You know, while I was there, I spent time in the library because I became a certified paralegal. And I began to study a great deal about the law. I thought I knew the law and found out I didn't. And when I was studying, looking at the book, I discovered that Unicor was a prison industry group and the individuals on the board of directors were retired prosecutors and retired federal judges. Now that really says something to me, you know, that it's almost a form of chattel slavery where you have to make sure that you've got slaves in order to do the work. I hope that many of our young people out here come to the conclusion that I came to, that one need not supply themselves in order to do one particular thing. That become to be a chattel, a chattel slave, slave. Because slavery, most of the guys probably didn't make but $200 a week working for the prison, $200 a month rather, working for the prison industries. And that $200 a month that they worked for the prison industry, they were making anything from computer boards and many things that they shouldn't have been making because the law clearly said that the things that they made were supposed to be utilized by the prison. But that stuff was given to those companies that needed those parts, where they probably went out and made hundreds of thousands of dollars. So therefore, that is a form of slavery, a form of slavery that should not exist. You had uh, what they call commissary. George Bush's cousin owned the, the, the company that supplied the commissary. So it was all about making one thing. As, uh, the young Hispanic gentleman from Milwaukee said, old oh man, this is all about making money. If they weren't making money, we wouldn't even be in here. And he was in there. That's when I discovered many individuals are in prison who really shouldn't be in there because he had a father-in-law that fire, alcohol, firemen, tobacco caught him because allegedly he was selling guns. And the only thing he had done was gone to the grocery store with him. And they followed him there and they took both of them into custody there. He said, I, should, I was married to my father-in-law's daughter. I shouldn't even have been in here. I don't know what he does. I was just his son-in-law. They had another gentleman I met in prison named Norm. Norm was uh, an Amish fellow. Caucasian, pale face. And Norm, he was in there because he began to organize the Amish people from taking subsidies, all right, from the government, that they were gonna grow food on the land and just rotate it. And when they found out he was doing that, all of a sudden, what they ended up doing was they indicted him for fraud, for accepting money when he was growing stuff on the land. And at the time that he was accepting the money, he wasn't growing anything on the land. But they alleged they had a satellite and they got a guy who owed over $100,000 in back taxes, wiped out his taxes, and had him to testify against Noah. That's one unique thing in our society. A convicted felon can testify against you, but you couldn't go get a convicted felon to testify for you. They would not allow that. You know, in my particular case, for example, here's a man that stole a million and a half, half dollars, which most of the people at Highland Bank probably don't know, from the Highland Bank that Alderman Street had took him there and got him to loan, loan him a million and a half dollars, which he never paid. He kept the money and at the Cosmopolitan Bank. 